I'm encouraged to see you on this first day of the week and for what that means to us as the people of God. So uh, thank you for being here. Thank you, Stephen, for the reading. and Thank you, Larry, for uh, leading us in our singing. We're in 2 Peter chapter 2 as we're continuing on there and we're looking at a bigger passage than what's read beginning with the latter part of verse 10 going to the end of the chapter verse 22 and uh, just to give you a preview of what i'm kind of thinking is coming up uh, when we finished second peter we had a request to study the prophet ezekiel and if you've ever read in ezekiel you know that that's uh it's pretty difficult uh, material there so Again, I won't have all the answers, but I can assure you it's not talking about spaceships or UFOs. And uh, we'll see what God's Word says to us there. It's part of God's inspired Word, and it is, uh, it's helpful for our life. So that's maybe a book that we haven't read that much. So that's where we will be after we finish 2 Peter. We've been working our way, th- we went through 1 Peter and working our way through 2 Peter, and we're here in chapter 2. And the... Last week we were looking in chapter 2. Peter says he's writing for two reasons. One is, uh, as long as he's alive, he says he's going to encourage his readers. As long as he's in this earthly body. The other reason, there's a danger. The danger is there are false teachers out there. And he says, I need to tell you about them. I need to warn you about them. And that's what he has done. And really that kicks in in chapter 2. See verse 1, but there were also false prophets among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you. And then he describes them. And as we saw last week, he gives three illustrations of God's judgment. Angels, when they sin, God did not spare them. The, the people at the time of the flood and also Sodom and Gomorrah. But also, he says, God uh, can burn in his wrath and knows how to judge, but also he will rescue. He rescued Noah, he rescued Lot, and he will rescue us. And so he talks about these false teachers. Now, we continue really on in this passage. He explains more about them and what they are like and he calls them daring, self-willed, unreasoning animals, stains and blemishes, accursed children, springs without water or clouds or mist driven by the wind, clouds that, that have no rain in them. And so we're going to look a little closer at what he says and then we're working up to those verses that Stephen read, which I think is the point of this whole passage. And so the first thing he says, if you'll open your Bibles and look there, at the latter part of verse 10 into verse 11, he says, they're bold and arrogant. They are not afraid to heap abuse on celestial beings. Yet even angels, although they are stronger and more powerful, do not heap abuse on such beings when bringing judgment on them from the Lord. So they're they're bold or they're daring, they're self-willed, these false teachers. And he said earlier, God knows how to keep the unrighteous under punishment for the day of judgment. And some of these false teachers in Peter's day, and this still continues today, are so arrogant, they consider themselves to be the final authority. They despise true and proper authority, and and they have no fear really their pride leads them to this boastful attitude and they don't tremble to blaspheme glories that's what the text literally says and the glories there uh, he contrasts the false teachers and angels now he says angels are greater in might and power but they don't bring a reviling judgment against them before the Lord Jude verse 9 might give us an example of this. This Jude tells us, and we don't have all the answers to this background and what he's talking about there, but he said, Michael, the archangel, when he disputed with the devil and argued over the body of Moses, did not dare pronounce against him a railing judgment. 
but said, the Lord rebuke you. And there are all kind of questions we could ask of that verse. You know, what people have said, what's he talking about? The body of Moses? And, and, all, and some have suggested the body of Moses are the Israelites. I, I'm not convinced by that. But you have an argument between Michael, the archangel, and the devil. And it says, he did not dare pronounce against him a railing judgment. He left that in God's hands. So angels are stronger and more powerful than humans, yet even angels don't do what these false teachers do, Peter says. They make their own judgments against Satan and, and demons. Angels are humble and they recognize God is the one who is, who is the judge. There are those in our day, there were those in Peter's day, who will even dismiss the reality that there is a, a devil and demonic forces. Daniel chapter 9 talks about a, a battle of angels and demons, and it's really on a national level. It's almost like every nation has angels that are watching over it. And again, there are a lot of questions that are there. We find Jesus confronting demons, demonic forces, and in Matthew 4, Jesus is directly tempted by the devil. And Paul states in Ephesians chapter 6, as you probably know, he says we wrestle not with physical powers, with flesh and blood, but with principalities and powers of darkness in the heavenly places. Now, despite all that evidence, there are those who will say, well, no, there's no real Satan. There's no, there's no force of evil that's there. Yet scripture points out very clearly Satan and demons are real beings. Now don't get, don't get terrified, paralyzed by that, but also we have to recognize, I mean, probably one of the greatest uh, joys that Satan would have would be if somebody didn't recognize his reality because then he can slip around. And so scripture says he's real and recognize that he is, a, he, he is your enemy. Uh, there are others who take the exact opposite approach and they recognize that demons and Satan exist, but they ignore what kind of beings they are and these false teachers here are ranting and raving and, and they feel like they have such authority, such power over these spiritual beings and even demanding that, that these evil beings and Satan stop what they are doing. I mean, I saw early on uh, when COVID was just hitting the news and it was spreading, you know, all over. And it was a, a TV preacher, and uh, he put on a big show, and he he said, "I'm going to to call Satan and call the demons to account for this, and I rebuke you, and you're going to stop this COVID, and we're not. I'm not going to allow you to do that." Um, that I mean, again, that's what Peter's talking about. That's pretty bold. Uh, he says these false teachers have such boldness as that. In Acts chapter 19, you have some Jewish exorcists, and they thought they could just cast out demons by having the magical formula. And it says that some of the Jewish exorcists went from place to place, and they attempted to name over those who had the evil spirits the name of the Lord Jesus. And Luke even tells us what they were saying. They were saying, I adjure you by Jesus whom Paul preaches. And seven signs of one Skeua, or Skeva as you might pronounce it, a Jewish chief priest were doing this. And the evil spirit answered and said, I recognize Jesus and I know about Paul, but who are you? Who are you? And the man in whom was the evil spirit jumped on them and subdued them and overpowered them so that they fled out of the house naked and wounded. This is dangerous area here. Peter says these false teachers just fill with boldness and authority. They're going to take on Satan. Now the Bible commands us in James 4, 7 is one place to submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. The Bible doesn't say attack the devil and overpower him. They're not to be, uh, Satan and his demons are not to be played with. We need 
uh, not to cower down in fear because scripture says greater is he that is in you than he who is in the world but it's not in ourselves that power to fight him it's in the power that Jesus has has overcome him so these false teachers and te false teachers today are daring they're self-willed Peter says that's that's not good he also says if you look at verse 12 but these people blaspheme in matters they do not understand. They are like unreasoning animals, creatures of instinct, born only to be caught and destroyed. And like animals, they too will perish. They're unreasoning animals. They rely on their own instinct, is the idea. They, the result is they blaspheme, they revile, they accuse about things in which they're ignorant. And just like animals, he says, in nature are destroyed, so too will they. Verse 13, he goes on to say, they will be paid back with harm for the harm they have done. In other words, they cheat others and they'll be cheated. They, they'll be paid back. They end up um, enjoying the fruits of, the, of their wrong deeds. Uh, they end up having, you're going to be so bold against demons and against Satan, you're going to have demonic problems is probably the idea here. So they're unreasoning animals. Verses 13 and 14, look at these verses. He says they're stains and they're blemishes. <clears throat> we read the first part of 13. It says then, continuing, their idea of pleasure is to carouse in broad daylight. They are blots and blemishes, reveling in their pleasures while they feast with you. With eyes full of adultery, they never stop sinning. They seduce the unstable. <clears throat> they are experts in greed. They're stains and blemishes. Their greed, their pride, their roving eyes. And even that can be blatant and open to people. We might see that in false teachers, but people overlook that for a variety of reasons. Maybe because of the things that they're promising, the empty promises that are there. And the fall into such blatant sins by people who put themselves in leadership positions among God's people is, is very terrible. It's a stain, it's a blemish on the church and on God's people. And you think about the negative impression that causes in the world. And it leaves unbelievers and in discouragement. And the world looks at the church and says, you have that? I mean, that's all I see. I don't want to. I mean, what? let me show you something. What, what do you see? Well, you see a pretty much empty hand, clean hand. But if I do this, you may have to put your glasses on if you wear glasses, but what do you see there? You see a spot, you see a blemish, you see a stain. <clears throat> I hope that'll come off, but. Well, the majority of the hand is still clean, isn't it? I didn't color the whole hand. But that one spot, that one blemish, that's what you see. That's what you focus. You focus on, on that. And he says, these false teachers are stains. They're blemishes. And when the world looks at the church and they see false teachers like that, that's what they see. They see the stain. They see the spot and the blemish. And the unbelievers justify themselves for not becoming followers or, or Christians. And immature believers stumble because of that. <clears throat> Look at verses 14 and 15. He says that they are uh, accursed children at the end of verse 14, an accursed brood or accursed children. <clears throat> they left the straight way and wandered off to follow the way of Balaam, son of Bezer, who loved the wages of wickedness. They're accursed children. And then he, I mean... He says, verse 16, he, that's Balaam, was rebuked for his wrongdoing by a donkey, an angel without speech, who spoke with a human voice and restrained the prophet's madness. 
you know this account. You've heard of this in the Hebrew Scriptures of fault uh, of this man named Balaam, Bilam, in Hebrew. These false teachers are falling right in the footsteps of, of Balaam. That's found in Numbers chapters 22 through 24. We don't have time, and we're not going back there to read that. But the situation is this. The king of Moab, or Moab, was Balak, and he's just... He just saw, he just observed the children of Israel under Moses wipe out the Amorites. And he's scared to death that he's next. And so he decides to deal with that situation by trying to hire a prophet. He's a, he's a prophet, as somebody said, a prophet for a prophet. A, a P R O P H E T for P R O F I T. A prophet for a prophet, and he's a strange individual. We don't, you know, we don't know a lot about him. But <clears throat> he, uh, Balak says, "I'm going to hire you, and I want you to curse these Israelite people." Um, and yet, Balaam wants money. I mean, God tells uh, Balaam uh, to go if the men call on him. But then Balaam wants to reward money. He doesn't wait for the men to come, and so he saddles up. He's on his way. To go, and it's on that trip <clears throat> that God uses this donkey to get His attention. I mean, imagine that. This is not something I made up. This is not a fairy tale. Here's this man on a donkey, and his donkey won't go, and he beats the donkey, and the donkey won't go, and he beats the donkey, and finally, the, you know, the donkey speaks to him, and the donkey has observed this. I'm sure the angel didn't look like that. But he sees this, this mighty angel in the way with a, with a drawn sword. Here's this false teacher, Balaam, and then a donkey is rebuking him. And Peter says these false teachers are like that as, as well. Well, you know the account. Uh, Balak says, I want you to curse them. Every time he opens his mouth, it's a blessing on God's people. Now, the passage ends in Numbers. I mean, we might think, well, God has rebuked him with his donkey. That's the end of the story. <clears throat> but you go over to the end of Numbers, toward the end, Numbers 31 in verse 16, and it says Balaam still earned his money from King Balak because he told him, here's how you, here's how you cause the downfall of the Israelites. And he seduced them with Moabite women. And it was so terrible that Balak followed that advice of Balaam that the result was Israel sinned and the Lord sent a plague and in one day killed 23,000. And a thousand more were executed for their sin. That's the same way false teachers operate. They've forsaken the, the narrow way and they're trying to bring anybody else that will follow them. That's, they wander around. They have this, this greed. They exploit those around them. Now, look at uh, verse 17. Peter says, as he's still describing these false teachers, they are springs without water, mist driven by a storm. Blackest darkness is reserved for them. So two more descriptive pictures here. Springs without water and mist driven by, by a storm. Imagine that you were in a parched De desert and you're parched your, your throat's parched your goal is to find water you walk and you walk and you walk and finally you see a spring ahead you think and you get excited because you need this water to survive water's near but then you get to the spring and you collapse because the spring is dry springs without water imagine that you are a farmer and your whole land has a drought and the land is cracking even because of no rain. You need rain. The well's going dry. Finally, you see way off these black, uh, black cloud. A storm is coming, so out of that rain will come and it gets closer and closer and closer. And you know, like when it's going to rain, you feel the wind off the, the, the clouds. It's coming in. But then it comes, and all you feel is just the wind, the mist. It doesn't rain. 
No rain. And so that's what the false teachers are like. They promise, give all this promise, but they are springs without water, mist driven by a storm. And Peter says there, like uh, you look at the end of verse 17, blackest darkness is reserved for them because God is light and they've gone into the way of darkness. They speak these arrogant words, verse 18, boastful words by appealing to the lustful desires of the flesh. They entice people who are just escaping from those who live in error. They promise them freedom while they, they themselves are slaves of depravity. For people are slaves to whatever has, has mastered them. They promise freedom, yet they can't offer you freedom because they're slaves to this corruption. Now, it's at this point <clears throat> that Peter makes some conclusions about the false teachers. And that's verses that, the verses that Stephen read, 20 through the end of the chapter. If they have escaped the corruption of the world by knowing our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and are again entangled in it and are overcome, they are worse off at the end than they were at the beginning. It would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than to have known it and then to turn their backs on the sacred command that was passed on to them. Of them, the Proverbs are true. A dog returns to its vomit, and a sow that is washed returns to her wallowing in the mud. I mean, the thought's simple here. Peter's already said in verse 1 that they've known the truth, and yet the false teachers have turned from the truth. The problem's not ignorance. That's why he can say that the, their, their latter end is worse, because they've known the truth. It's not being ignorant of the truth and being taught the truth. They've known the truth, but they've rejected, they've turned away from that truth. Uh, Matthew 7, 21, uh, probably one of the saddest verses in Scripture, Jesus says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? And in your name cast out demons, and in your name perform many miracles. And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. So that's what Peter says these false prophets are like. And he says that eventually they'll be revealed. It's just like these Proverbs. A dog returning to its vomit and a pig wallowing in the mud again. I started to put some pictures of that up there, but I decided uh, I would not. So, but you pictured in your mind a dog returning to its to its vomit and a, and a pig just wallowing in in, in the mud. Uh, Jesus talks about one time in Matthew twelve forty three through forty five about a man <clears throat> who was delivered, and it's it, he says he was like a house that's unoccupied, swept clean, put in order. And the final condition of that man is worse than the first. That's how it will happen with this wicked generation. And so Peter, is, he's quoting from Proverbs 26, 11 about the dog and the vomit. But he's saying it's, it's just, this is how it is. They were cleansed, but they didn't, they've turned away from that. Now, what do these verses, 20 through 22, teach us? I just want to list these things. I didn't make slides of this. I just want to list this real quick. This is right from the text, right from these verses. It shows us that it's through Jesus we escape defilement or sin. It also shows us there is a way of righteousness that we are to walk in, that God's people are to walk in. It's a safe path that's marked out for us. A third thing is it's possible for a person who confessed Christ, who's once freed from slavery, to become entangled again in sin. It doesn't just say involved in sin, entangled. And you think about something that's just tangled up, entangled in sin. Fourthly, it's possible for a person who has confessed Christ to um, be overcome by sin. Fifth, if a person who confesses Christ 
continues to sin, goes back to sin without repenting, that final bondage is worse. Like he says, like a dog to vomit and a pig to mud. And then the sixth thing, this final state, it shows really an animal nature. I mean, why does he use illustrations of a dog and vomit and pig and, and mud? He's already called them brute beasts back in verse 12. Paul in Acts 20 calls false teachers wolves. Dogs, pigs, they're unclean. So the point is, beware of false teachers, Peter says. Keep your eyes open. If they've, after they've escaped this, these defilements through the knowledge of our Lord and Savior and become entangled again, that last state is worse, worse than the first. Larry has announced number 714, Trust and Obey. We're going to sing that as an invitation song. If you're not a Christian, you need to know that God loves you, that He sent His Son to take our place, to die for our sins. And he calls us to turn from sin, repent of our sins, confess His name, and be immersed. And if you've done that and you've wandered away, and the good news again is there's time to come back. It's not just now, but God is open, but you might not have another day. You might not live another day, and Jesus might come. He could come at any time. And so it's our prayer uh, that if you need to come, we're ready to help you in any way while we stand and while we sing this song.